Here at Calvary Assembly, we know that God is faithful. Over the years, we have been able to witness his life-changing hope being shared with people and changing lives in our community. In fact, we've seen consistent growth over the course of the last 20 years. We've now reached a point where the people that God has brought into our church exceeds the amount of space that we have to work with in our current facility. What would it look like to expand our space so that the life-changing hope of Jesus could be shared with even more people in our community who so desperately need it? What's our next step as a church family? Through thoughtful prayer and consideration, our church has committed to a path that will take us into the heart of God's plan for us. This is your journey. This is our journey. This is next. Public Assembly is my family because they welcomed me and especially like the youth, the people who really, you know, are the reason I'm a Christian today. Like they help me through hard times, they help me in great times, like they're always there and always consistent. But even though a lot of the people have changed, it just we feel welcome, we feel loved. The atmosphere of uh, everyone we're around, they're always loving and open to um, talking with you if you need it. Through the ministry of the Lord, uh, to people here, the way I'm filled up just compels me to pour out. We feel that it's a safe place and we're just excited to get behind that vision. However old they are, young they are, like it's just really amazing to see God work in everybody's life. One cool thing about my life, because I'm married to a pastor, is I've gotten to see stories, parts of people's stories that I didn't used to get to see. And I've seen miracles that are much harder, I think, to achieve than, than healing miracles. They're people's hearts and minds being healed and growing. And I've seen what Jesus does, and it's made me more convinced that that's what I want to do. That's what uh, we're here for. And I love seeing what Jesus does in this community. What's next? Where are we going? How will we accomplish our mission? And what does all of this mean for you? And what does this mean for me? It's why we are going to invite you to come out to one of our vision nights. This is where we will have conversations centered around the next phase of our church, what it's going to look like, and your and my role in all of this. We'll have great food, community, and we'll leave with a clear vision of where we are going as a church and why we're going there. Because of God, there's always a next. With God, there's always a next. With God, there's always a next. With God, there's always a next. You might not have realized it when you walked into this place this morning, but you're actually here for one of the most important days in the history of our church family. Because today we're actually launching an initiative to create more space and more seats for your friends and your family members whose lives have not yet been touched and influenced by the grace of God. You might be surprised to learn that grace is actually quite a rare commodity in our world that there's a cheap substitute that our world settles for. It's called tolerance. But I don't know anybody who wants to be tolerated. I think all of us want to experience grace. And the wonderful thing about grace is it always accepts us where we are, but never leaves us as we are. Grace has incredible transforming capacity and uh, ability in our lives. So I'd like you to look, and under the seat in front of you, there is a little booklet. I can pull mine out. It looks just like this. If you would pull it out, this is a very important little uh, magazine that we've made available for you. And, uh, and it's going to help you be able to process information as we go through this next season in our church family. Uh, this is what I honestly believe. I honestly believe that with God, there is always a next. In fact, would you say that statement with me? With God, there is always a next. It really is a statement filled with faith, filled with hope, and filled with grace. That there isn't some line that you have crossed where God has just said, that's as much as I can do with you. If there's breath in your body, he's got a next thing for you. 
So there's things you've not completed that God has for you. There's things that you've not achieved that God has available for you. There are, you have influence, you have opportunity, you have gifts, and God is committed to converging those things together to bring you to a place of making a difference in the world in which we live. We think that's true of you individually. We think that's true of our church family. Um, it would, uh, so I, I asked everyone to pull this out. I'm going to ask that you take this and keep this. We have lots of them, so it's okay. And if you are a husband and wife, take one for each, because I don't want someone to be without it if they want to reference it later on. This resource is going to help you understand the path that we're on and the pace that we're moving. It contains really important information, so I'm going to ask you this week, just take some time to carefully review it. If you just look real quick at the bottom of page three, bottom of page three, that is an old picture. It was probably made by a Kodak camera. And that's a very young me in front of the room uh, before I, I got uh, uh, managed by, by staff on how to dress it down a little bit. That is a suit and a tie. And I don't know if you noticed, but over on the left-hand side is cutting edge, te cutting edge technology. It's an overhead projector that we used to use to display the lyrics for our songs. And then on the right is where we are right now. Uh, what I want you to know is that God has been incredibly gracious to us and has influenced so many lives by his grace that have come through here. Uh, if you uh, look over at page 17, you will notice that there's a devotional. We're asking you to walk with us on this journey for the next 28 days, beginning today. This will take just three to five minutes of your time, depending on how long you process it. And this is our goal. We all want to read the same scripture. Every one of us that are part of this church family, read the same scripture every day, access the same insight every day, see the same prayer focus every day, but this is what we know. While we all read the same thing, God will speak very unique things to each and every one of us. So I'm just going to ask you a few minutes a day, let's take this journey together and see what God may speak to us. Because I believe God has given our church family a remarkable picture of what is possible. He has called us to be a safe place where people can find authentic faith, that we don't force them to make a premature decision, that they can take their time to calculate the cost and to find the reasons that enable them to trust God for all of their life. And we also are a place where people can find real friendships, risk real relationships, that we have already something in common at the cross of Christ and the grace of God. And we find so many other things in common as we do this life journey together. And then we also discover that we have a future together, that there are gifts, talents, and abilities God has placed in our lives and opportunities he will present in our lives so that we can become all that he intends us to be. So this is the journey that we're going to be on. And this little booklet will help provide some information to you, but there's also something that is coming up, and it's this week, it's Tuesday, Wednesday, this week, and Thursday of next week, and they're vision nights, and I'm really encouraging, if you've not signed up, please be a part of that, because we have information we want to present to you, but we also want to be able to hear questions from you, and so uh, the food is going to be great, the time is going to be enjoyable, and I hope that you can join us. Let's continue on in Joshua chapter 1. And it says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Would you read the rest of this verse out loud with me? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the key. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, Sue and I and our two small children moved from Jamestown, New York, to the Chai Lai area. We packed up all of our belongings in a rental truck, 
We had less than 20 members who were part of our church family at that time, and they all met at our house on a Sunday afternoon after service to help us unload, which we did in remarkably quick time. All the boxes got into the house in just a couple of hours. Sue stood at the door and directed where they were to go. Now, to say that the boxes all got unpacked and everything put where it was the same day would be a mistake. In some cases, it took us a year to find all the stuff that we had packed away. Moving in and living in are two very different things. Having a promise given and possessing that promise are two very different things. The nation of Israel had been given incredible promises. Joshua had been given incredible promises. But they weren't possessing those promises yet. God had intended that they would possess those promises. So Joshua and the nation of Israel were on the border of the promised land. This was the land that God had sworn to give to them. And, uh, but they've not possessed it yet. They've not moved in. They've not, they're not living there. And what's interesting is that uh, Joshua is actually one of the individuals who over 80 years, uh, almost 80 years prior to this, had actually escaped from Egypt as, and, and from slavery to go into the wilderness. God had brought the nation here earlier, but they had been unwilling to move forward. And so Joshua has seen all of that, and, and he's been almost 80 years wandering in the wilderness. And he's now brought back to a place where God is saying, I'm going to move you into this promised land. What's interesting is when they were in the wilderness, this is what they ate for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. Does anybody know? Manna. Manna. What does the word manna mean? It means, what is it? That's literally what it means. In Hebrew, if you want to say, what is that? You go, manna. That's what you say. Because they would walk out of their tent and, and God would rain down this stuff from heaven. And it looked like little flaky seeds. And when you picked it up and you tasted it, which they did because I learned from a missionary, when you are hungry enough, you will eat anything. And when you are tired enough, you will sleep anywhere. And that explains why missionaries eat things we would never eat. And so they, they tasted it, and it tasted sweet. And so they, they, they learned lots of ways to produce manna and to fix manna. Baked manna. Boiled manna. Manna on a stick. <laughs> Manicotti. I mean, just all the, lots of, they keep finding ways. Just every day, and, and this was the really cool thing. Every day you would just go out of your tent. All you had to do is kneel down, scoop it up, and that was your manna allotment for the day. It was the coolest thing. And now God is saying, I actually want to take you to a place where there's not this supernatural substance that falls from the sky, but I'm going to give you another kind of miracle to participate. It's the miracle of planting, plowing, reaping, cultivating, harvesting, this is the seasons that I'm calling you into. And the question is, why would anybody do that? Like, why would you go through all the work of plowing and planting and cultivating and harvesting when you can just go outside your tent and kneel down and get what you need for the day? And the truth is, is that we do appreciate some variety. Not very many of us will eat the same thing every day. But there's other reasons for this, too. And the first is, is that when you have manna for the day, you just have manna for yourself. But... In the promised land, you will have food for yourself and your family and for lots of other people. The second thing is, in the wilderness, it's a nomadic existence. You just have to keep wandering around. You keep moving. You go through a series of cycles that just keep repeating themselves, but you don't gain any progress. But in the promised land, you can actually build something of substance that will outlast your lifetime. And so the nation of Israel is brought to this moment. It's a significant moment in their history. It's a significant moment in their destiny. So that's why God calls us to move into a promised land. Now, some of us prefer things the way they are. I'm a creature of habit. I'll be the first one to admit it. If I go to a subway that I've been to a few times before, most of them already know my order. I walk in. If they see me in the parking lot, they have it ready to go. I always get the same thing. I don't ever deviate. Now, I don't get the same thing in every restaurant, but I, I get the same thing when I'm at Subway. If I go to McDonald's, there's things that I tend to get at McDonald's. Anybody else a creature of habit? I do not understand people who go into a fast food restaurant and spend five minutes looking at a menu. 
It hasn't changed in 20 years. Just get the thing you always get. Move on. <laughs> now you know how to pray for me. Okay. <laughs> so why bother? A lot of us would prefer things kind of stay as they are, either because we're comfortable. Maybe this is a really good season in your life, and if it is, I'm thrilled. I really am. I mean that. Maybe your marriage is good, and your kids are good, and the bills are paid, and, and, and the car is running, and the, and the washing machine is running. It's all good, and I'm grateful. And you don't really want much to change. I understand that. Accept that. God's goal in our lives is not to lead us to the most comfortable place, but the most meaningful place. And sometimes that will push us out of our comfort zones. There's another reason that some people are a little reluctant to move forward, and that is because of things they've experienced in the past. If you've been damaged enough in the past, you don't want any more of that. You can barely stand where you are right now. Another step, you can't stand the thought of losing one more thing or taking one more hit, and so you're not interested in going forward. So I don't think that God intends for us to be defined by the problems and our painful experiences of the past. We don't... We don't want to move forward, but God desires us to move forward. So we see we're introduced to this character called Joshua. Joshua is an interesting guy. He is one of the individuals, one of two individuals still alive who escaped from Egypt as slaves almost 80 years previously. And in that course of time, he had also, also served as captain of the army, though admittedly they hadn't had a lot of battles while they're wandering in the wilderness. Turns out not a lot of people will attack you while you're in the wilderness. And there's another thing. He'd been one of the 12 spies who had been sent by Moses on a reconnaissance mission into the land of Canaan to find out what kind of fruitfulness was there and what kind of risks there were there. He was one of two people who came back with a very positive report. The other ten who accompanied him on that mission saw more problems than profit, and they were very concerned. They put it up for a democratic vote to the nation of Israel, of which there were over a million of them at that time, and they voted to stay where they were, which is why they spent another 40 years in the wilderness. When you read through the book of Joshua, you discover it's actually a book about how people engage in struggle and tackle problems in order to experience what God had planned for them. And that's a really important thing for us to understand. By the way, there's some similarities between Joshua and Jesus, too. First of all, they both have the same name. In Hebrew, the, the word is Yeshua, and that's the exact same name as Jesus, Yeshua. What's interesting, too, is not only did they share the same name, they kind of have a similar mission, and that Joshua was called to lead his people out of wilderness and into the promised land. And Jesus calls us out of the wilderness of our own wanderings apart from God and to live out the fullness of the promises that God has for our lives. And so there are lots of things in Scripture that when you read them, they're intended to be descriptive. They tell us what actually happened. So, for example, it tells us that David had multiple wives. It told us that his son Solomon had more than multiple wives. In fact, uh, he could sleep with a different woman every single night and not get through the number of wives in a year. The Bible is not saying that's how it's supposed to be. Some people look at Scripture and they go, well, if, if that happened and it's in the Bible, then, you know, uh, you just think that through, okay? Uh, so parts of Scripture are descriptive, not prescriptive, but some parts of Scripture are prescriptive. And there are lots of those kinds of experiences in the book of Joshua where it's giving us not just an historical account of what happened, but insight into how God operates in our world and with his people and how his people can partner with him in experiencing his promises come to life. And so there's some very powerful things. So we're going to uh, uh, look at this. The, I want you to think about this in very personal terms. All right? So in your relationships, if God was going to bring you to the next level in your relationships, what would that look like? How about your marriage? What would the next level in your marriage look like? Or your relationship with your children? Or, or your, your academic career? Or your business career? Or, or, or maybe uh, 
uh, just even your, your own your resources, your, your, the, the material things that you have, what would the next level of those things look like if God were going to take you into the next thing? This is important because remember, we started this, this talk this morning by acknowledging with God, there is always a next. He has some wonderful things for us. So God desires to expand your vision of what he has for you. God desires you to see more than you see today. If this is the best your life has ever been, fantastic. But it's not as good as God intends it to be. He's got some wonderful things for you. Now, it will stretch you, and it will challenge you, but all of those things are worthwhile. And God is committed to leading you to your potential. God will never act in a way that puts you back to less than he intends for you. He always is committed to leading you towards your potential. So the only question is, what is our commitment to God? If his commitment is to lead us to our potential, can our commitment to be to follow him as he leads us? God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So we don't have to be afraid of what has happened. We don't have to be so comfortable with what is happening that we're unable to take the step into the next thing that God has for us. Uh, how many here have discovered that your height has a limit? <laughs> I don't meet hardly anybody who's happy with their height. They either think they're too tall or they're too short. Until my son was born, I was the tallest Reeves to ever live. <laughs> See, you laugh. Because you know. And my son broke the, the mold on that, and, and he went significantly past the rest of us, and we cheered every inch. Our tribe improved. We were <laughs> thrilled. There's a limit to your height. I, I don't know if there's a limit to our weight. <laughs> Some of us are working on that. And then there's a limit to our intellect. There, there, there's a limit to how much information you can process and retain. But there are aspects of your life, your internal life, that are limitless. And God is committed to growing and developing us to the kind of people who are very different than anything our world is used to seeing. He's committed to that. So there's three things that Joshua teaches us. And the first is that the next thing God has for you will not be automatic. It doesn't just fall into your lap like a ripe piece of fruit. It's not how it is. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be problems to solve. You're going to have to contend for some things. Some issues you face might be internal. And they might be external. There are obstacles. There will be resistance. Uh, any sports team, uh, they might finish the season undefeated and win a championship but nobody gives that to them. They've got to go out, whatever the frequency of their games are, and, and, and prepare for that game, and practice, and, and study, and then go out and do their very best, and they win game after game after game. The promises of God do not just fall into our laps. We're going to have to take steps of faith along the way. Secondly, there are forces in this world determined to keep you from your future. I wish I could tell you that everyone will applaud when you say you want to grow and develop and become even more. Some people get very anxious with that kind of language. And it's not just what other people say to us, it's what we say to ourselves. Some of our self-talk is horrific. It's a form of verbal abuse when you think about it. It's unbelievable the thoughts that come into our mind and then we just accept. Why do we accept those as true? Why don't we challenge thoughts that, that encourage us to settle for less or let go of what we already have? Why don't we challenge those thoughts? When, when people speak into our lives, why do some people's voices, especially when they're putting us down or telling us that we can't, why do those voices produce memories that are so much more powerful than the people who told us that we could do something or we were able Jesus reveals what's going on. It's not just thoughts and it's not just voices, but there is actually an evil one in our world who uses all of that communication, whether internal or external, to try to dissuade us, discourage us, or disintegrate us from experiencing the fullness of the things that God has for our lives. He said the evil one comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy but he turns right around and says, I have come so that you might have life to the full, abundantly. That's why Jesus is here. So we have to learn to challenge these thoughts and challenge these voices, not just automatically accept them. And then thirdly, it's never too late to take the next step. 
uh, Joshua had been near this spot before. He's on the border of the promised land. And his report about the possibility and profitability of this place had been ignored. And when the vote was taken, he lost. And while he was responsible for managing the people of Israel for the last few years, what was also true is that he didn't think there was any more possibility of moving into the promised land. What surprised him is that in an encounter with God, he discovered that God had not forgotten the promises that he had made to him. Joshua assumed that a vote and age overruled what God was able to do. And what God tells him is, I remember my promises, and I will fulfill my promises in you if you're ready to go in. It's astonishing how many of us automatically assume that because we bypassed an opportunity that we discounted the promises of God. Let me tell you something. That opportunity may be gone, but God still has a promise over your life, and he intends to fulfill it in your life. And we need to learn to be people who expect that. Just think of how your life could be if you expected the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life. So, if you haven't heard any promises, uh, I don't, I'm not encouraging you to make one up. I'm not one of those people who, because we got a lot of them in our culture now, you just look inside, everything you need is inside. Uh, a lot of what's inside you don't want. You know, just let's look up rather than in. Let's see what God will speak into our lives, because our self-talk is not great, right? So there's three prayer focuses, and I'm going to have the worship team actually come up now. And uh, there's three prayer focuses I'd like you to think about. And the first is this. Uh, it says, Heavenly Father, would you help me to trust that you are good, that you are motivated by love, and you want what is best for my life? Would you help me to see? And then I just want you to write a sentence out on your notes. What is it you want God to help you see? Maybe it's something to see for your family that you can't see right now. Or to see for your finances that you can't see right now. Or to see for academics or your vocation. Something in your life. You would like it to be different than it is, better than it is. You just can't see it. Just take a moment and jot that down. I'm asking everybody to do this. It's only going to take a minute. Second prayer focus is, Heavenly Father, I know I will face temptations and struggles. Would you help me to? What do you want God to do for you when those disqualifying thoughts come, when the distractions come? How would you like God to help you in that moment? Just write down your own sentence of what that is. Heavenly Father, I know that you have wonderful plans for our church family. Would you help us to, and I just want you to, what would you like God to do for our church family? Because we're family. God has brought us together. He's got a purpose and plan for our lives. What would you like God to do in and through this place? Now, if we could all stand. And this is what we're going to do. Uh, I believe one of the most effective, culture-changing, life-changing, situation-changing things we can ever engage in is prayer. Please understand that it's not because our prayer is powerful. It's because the one we're talking to is powerful, and he can do anything. 
And in case you think you're not good enough to be heard by God, you should know that God does not answer prayers because we are good. God answers prayers because he is good. And that's where our faith is. My faith is not in my getting the words just right or the tone of my voice or the length of my prayer. My faith is, is that there's one in heaven who notices every heartbeat and breath I will ever take and ever have. And he listens to every sigh, he sees every tear, and he pays attention to every single prayer. And he doesn't just do that for the pastor in the front of the room. He does that for every single person who will call on his name. No exceptions, and you are not one. So this is what I want us to do. We're going to read the first part of the prayer out loud together, but when we get to the sentence part that you wrote, I want you to keep reading it right out loud. All right? I want your ears to hear your voice call on your Heavenly Father because that is how a difference is made in our world. So let's begin this together. Heavenly Father, would you help to trust that you are good, that you are motivated by love, and that you want what is best for my life? Would you help me to see Heavenly Father, I know I will face temptations and struggles. Would you help me to? Heavenly Father, I know that you have wonderful plans for our church family. Would you help us to? Can we just applaud our Heavenly Father for hearing and being in the process of answering this morning.